There was a man. That's like that's like when you get a camera shoved in your face. You know, you're at the protest and they're give me some words. Hi, mom. Hi, mom. Uh, uh, America. <laughs> I'm here for freedom. <laughs> but that's it. Nothing else. It costs a lot of money. I like freedom. Amen. Hmm. So what it be? Welcome to the Darker Side Podcast, where we delve into the darker side of our existences. The morbid, the macabre, the spooky, and the absurd are all fair game as we discuss murder, UFOs, cryptids, creepypasta, the paranormal, and the dark depravity of the human soul. I am David, and with me today is Herman. Herman, how the hell are we today, buddy? Oh, it's good to be back, man. Uh, we're great. We're doing great. We are doing great. Unfortunately, Forrest cannot be with us. He is uh, vacationing this weekend in the great state of Maine. Unfortunately. Kind of like uh, Herman, as he often does. Yes, yes, I love the great state of Maine. <laughs> it's, it, is a, uh, it is a great state. It's uh, green, there. And, and it's Maine. It's green. Nice roads for uh, putting some tire rubber down. Yeah. Good place. Some motorcycling. Yeah. All right, guys, well, we're coming f- to you today. On what could you know be said as a, a beautiful, typical October day <laughs> in, in the the wonderful month of October in New England, it, it's fucking getting red and orange and Halloweenish out there. What are we supposed to call them now? Since since it's like summerish, but it's October. There, there, there's a there's like a racist term for that, and I don't want to do it. So we call it a native summer. We're having a native summer. Yes. In, uh, yes. It's, it's warm and it's humid and it's... Indigenous People's Summer. The Indigenous People's Summer on, yeah. on Indigenous People's Weekend. Yes, as it is, uh, yeah. on the great weekend of, uh, Indigenous People's Weekend. All right, well, we're going to jump into our news stories as of right now. Um, Herman, what do you got for a news story for us? Oh, I got a, I got an interesting one. Um, as, as is often the case, a, uh, a body was found in, uh, somewhere, uh, somewhere near Cleveland. I don't know where Col... Colerain Township in Ohio is, but the Cleveland Press picked it up. The authorities found a body in a nature preserve, which is pretty standard finding bodies fair. If I was going to leave a body somewhere, I'd probably choose a different location, like a nature not preserve. Yeah, somewhere that's not like, you know, you know a lot of people, you know, footpaths, etc. Yeah, just, just roll down to the, um, you know, the swamps of New Jersey or something. But anyway, so they found a body. Um, the investigation, however, was like Super open and shut. The <laughs> the uh, body turned out to be a life size sex doll. Uh, evidently, it was placed in a garbage bag, and uh, some people freaked out, as one would do if they saw a garbage bag with a what appeared to be a human body in it. But uh, no worries, people. It was just a sex doll, and I, w- I had to wonder what would cause somebody to throw a sex doll into a garbage bag and uh, cast it aside in such a manner. It's, I can think of a few things. One, it was just completely ruined and defiled, and this person had their absolute way with it. And mm. and as, like, you know, <laughs> someone who doesn't go that extra mile wouldn't kill the person, so they get a, a sex doll instead. Or the wife or the partner or somebody found this sex doll, and they hardly got rid of it as best as they possibly could. Interesting. Yeah, that's probably... Those are a couple of theories that I may have probably the case you prolapse your sex doll and it's time to get a fresh one <laughs> yeah yeah like uh you're too filthy i can't do this with you anymore that type of situation or maybe they just got heat like they had they used the sex doll to get into the high occupancy vehicle lane <laughs> for the uh, faster commute in the morning but started to get like Smokey's attention right like smoking the bandit yeah absolutely uh, the fuzz was on them the, like, hard. The, the fuzz was on them definitely uh, and they, they had to they had to sorry girl and just dispose dispose of the yeah. uh, evidence can't use you anymore. Yeah. Sorry, I gotta let you loose. Yeah, well, that's a fun little story out of uh, Ohio. Yeah, you know, nobody was hurt in the process except for, I don't know, maybe maybe that person's relationship or definitely the relationship with the sex doll. I don't think that doll's <laughs> returning anytime soon. No, not at all. Oh, good Lord. Well, I got a uh, story here from the, uh, is it brobible.com? Uh, I think you you sent this one to the the link. I'm oh, gonna read it up. Maybe it's a hard hitting news source. I definitely I definitely it's trusted worldwide. <laughs> bro I believe, Bible. I believe Trump reads Bro Bible. Yeah. This is a uh, man cooking up a ramen in a speedo accidentally shoots himself in the nuts with a twenty bottle rocket. Uh, with twenty bottle rockets. 
Yes. Holy Jesus. What, what combination of things, Dave, uh, are going on where that is even possible? I mean, I've done some weird stuff in the kitchen, clothed and or unclothed, and may have, you know, hurt parts of bodies that probably should have never touched boiling water, etc. But, uh, yeah, man. It's this, about is, this is a very interesting... Uh, <laughs> all right, uh, the headline tells the story. I don't know where to go from there. That's how the, uh, the article starts off. As any journalist would be wont to say. Right. Uh, I guess this would help to explain just who, what, why, when, and how often this cartoon-like catastrophe. A man in Taiwan was playing video games in just his Speedo and decided to make some ramen noodles. A box of bottle rockets was a little too close to the open <laughs> flames on the stove and started to fire. The rockets were aimed right at the dude's crotch. And again, this is right from the article. Mm. Oh, yeah. So, the dude's crotch. The dude's crotch, yeah. Oh, I forgot this is bro Bible. I, I, found a, uh, <laughs> I found a more credible article, but it was way less fun. Yeah. Let's go right to the scene as it unfolds. Uh, it was these sounds that alerted neighbors to call the fire department. When the emergency workers opened the door to Mr. Yee's room, they could vaguely see him through a cloud of smoke. Wearing a speedo on all fours, legs spread and yelling, ow, like screaming it. It's right there in the print. It's exclamation mark, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. I believe they use 14 W's for ow. <laughs> uh, Mr. Yee later described his ordeal to the media, saying all the fireworks seemed uh, to fly as if they somehow intended to hit him in his <laughs> banana hammock. His only defense was to flail his feet wildly in a desperate attempt to block one or two. Good Lord. Can you uh, imagine just like, yeah, I want, I'm, I'm playing video games in my Speedo. Why not? It's I my mean, place. It's get, it gets warm. There's, there's what is few, it, Taiwan? Yeah. There's few things that, that quite separate everything, like a Speedo. Yeah. Mm. Other than just not having one on. Yeah. Imagine if he didn't. Yeah. I, I, Good I, Lord. For swimming, I actually use a jammer, which is like a Speedo with long legs. It, it makes you feel like there's more clothing there, but there's no clothing there. Oh, Lord. Uh... Uh, the man was uh, treated and released from hospital with only minor <laughs> bruises and burns to his crotch. The ramen was ruined. Oh, man, the ramen. So what's interesting about that scene is um, w why I thought you would enjoy it, Dave, is uh, during my misspent youth, uh, I believe you and I had gone to the bar and your lovely wife had driven us back to your... Uh, the place where I was living the at the time. The place where you yeah. were living. I found a bunch of fireworks and thought it would be just great fun to light you them off just, in the house. You weren't just drunk, John. You were... You were you were hammered. Yeah, it was super. It was he was super I, Herman. I had I had, I had I had proceeded to uh, transcend drunkenness and turn it straight into debauchery. The do you were you were the Joker. Yeah, at that point, I did in fact I did in fact blow up uh, your sink and I think I destroyed your favorite coffee cup, which to this day I have not replaced. Yes, you're welcome. But it's okay. <laughs> I I love you still. So yeah, the, the smoke the it. smoke from just that action was pretty uh, pretty substantial. I can't imagine what a pile of bottle rockets would do and think of the squealing sound like the <laughs> that they make that's fantastic oh good that would that, that would have definitely alerted probably a bunch of people to call and that and smelling the smoke and everything else coming from that apartment what a scene that that probably was oh mr yee probably sounded like a cat getting stepped on too i mean that's i can only imagine all right well it is the month of october and uh the darker side uh podcast at this point is uh, we're going to be doing a we're going to start a new theme here. We're going to start talking about more like horror news, um, upcoming things that are going to be happening in regards to the horror world, uh, like a little brief segment that we're going to, we're going to do from, from this time on. Um, what I wanted to uh, discuss here is um, the upcoming Halloween movie. You've, you've heard anything about it? Um, yes. If there are no follow-up questions, <laughs> I have. So basically it's like this, uh, this follow-up to the the – the original two movies, but it's also like a rewrite at the same time, but it's, it's, it's supposed to work as a sequel to those as well to like finally finish the story. Okay. So it's like, it's like the, uh, Star Trek franchise from, uh, what's his name? Yeah. Eh, never mind. Abrams. But that was, that was a hot take, Dave. That was a hot take. <laughs> that was a super hot take. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So, I mean, that movie is coming out on Halloween. Um, but what I want to do on the darkest side podcast, uh, one of our next episodes, uh, is to review the original Halloween movie. Mm, John Carpenter. John Carpenter's keyboards make that movie. That yeah. is that is a testimony to the Casio keyboard. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that whole that movie is a great movie anyway. Just as a as a cult classic, it's forty years old. They're going to be putting it out on the four, this new one, H four O. It's not called H four O, but oh, thank God, it might as well be at this point. Remember when we went to go see H two O? 
yeah, when we it did. first came out. Yeah, oh no, that was great. So 20 years ago, we were we were seeing the 20th anniversary Halloween movie that came out. But uh, oh know. man, you, we, late night in a city is only the only way to see a horror movie. That was yeah. fantastic. At least we get to look uh, forward to uh, Jamie Lee Curtis again in another Halloween movie. Oh, she's going to be in it. Awesome. Yeah, yeah so. Yeah. Rob Zombie directing it? No, not Rob Zombie. They're um, probably good, actually. He yeah. puts his own flavor on things. Oh, absolutely. Um, also, what uh, uh, I wanted to talk about is uh, coming up is uh, Todd McFarlane is writing, directing, and producing the new Spawn movie. Oh. And he wants it to be a rated R, like, horror film. Oh, he wants it to not be trash? Yeah, he wants it to be basically... John Leguizamo his... accepted, of course. He, yeah. he tried to, he tried to recti- uh, resurrect the, uh, just a steaming pile of garbage, and he, he made it w- worth the ten points that I'm sure it has on the various uh, uh, websites. You'd be surprised. There's a lot of critics to that movie, and one of them is actually Todd McFarlane. So. Oh, no, nobody likes that movie. <laughs> that, that movie is like the Leonard Part 6 of comedy movies, yeah. but not a comedy of uh, comic movies. But he, he, he said, basically, he's like, I want it to be a horror film, but with a superhero involved. Hmm. Spawn. I mean, if you read the original comic series, it's basically what it was. You know? It was, it was, it was horror-themed. It was a little, maybe, campy. Um, yeah, I mean, a little the, bit, but... the head demon is the violator. It's, it's definitely... And he's also a, little... a clown and... He's a clown up here, and in, in, in hell he looks like, a, I don't know, kind of like a, the demon from Howard the Duck meets one of the alien creatures. Yeah, pretty much like a xenomorph with, like, yeah, exactly. Kind of an interesting play on all of that, but uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to maybe that, because I remember we actually went and saw Spawn, the original Spawn movie in the theater back in the day. Yeah, we did, and I had the, uh, I had the six-foot-tall cardboard cutout of Spawn that I got from a video store, and... Uh, I put it at the top of my stairs one dark night uh, when my family was what out. Dark and stormy night. It was a dark and stormy night. Yeah, so my whole my whole family. I was a teenager. My whole family was out doing like some family shit, and I had to work. And then nobody was home, so I came home and I set this giant spawn character at the top of the stairs. It just turned on the bathroom lights. So it was the six foot silhouette of some sort of demonic thing, and I waited. And my mother is the first one to open the door, and she let out this blood curdling shriek that was only that was only out out. You know, outsounded by my my hysterical cool laughter. After, yeah. Oh my god! Everybody was ev- nobody was pleased with me. It was I, I sort of ruined the evening, but it was it was a lot of fun. I'm glad I did it. You had a good night though. Yeah, my mother still talks about it affectionately, uh, yeah. and then calls me an asshole. <laughs> well, as mothers would. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, that's uh that's our, our brief little uh you know uh, upcoming events uh, in regards to the world of horror. Um, you'll take a look at that. Again, we'll, we will be reviewing um, the original Halloween movie. 40 years old coming up on this uh, this Halloween, which is interesting to think, man. Mm. No, it's just, that's a great one. Um, as long as we're not continuing down the series, Halloween 3 with the silver shamrock masks and all that was a little bit garbage. Right, but... right. No, I just want to do the original Halloween yeah. movie just to uh, review, kind of like we did with uh, Friday the 13th. Oh, what a great movie. Take that, Kevin Bacon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, well, uh, we're going to get into our Diving Deeper segment for the, uh, the episode. Um, we're going to be discussing a, uh, a very interesting series of events and uh, some interesting characters that happened da- back in, was it the 1989? Or, or into the late 80s, mid to late 80s, yeah. all this stuff started to happen yeah, down yes. there on the border of Mexico. Yeah, from about 76 to 1989, we had our, our good friend uh, Aldolfo Jesus Constanzo. Uh, sort of a, well, let me give you the elevator pitch. He was active during the cocaine era, the war on drugs, and he's sort of said to have been in charge of a cult that murdered at least 16 people and as, the, possibly as many as 60. Like I'm, the, I'm thinking it's probably well up near that 60 mark. Oh, yeah. From the research that I've, I've done on this, absolutely. Yeah, the, the, what it is is the confirmation versus the, the supposition. So you can, you can pin 16 on them easily, and then you got to do a little bit of work to get the rest of them, I guess. Yeah, because most of those people are, at this point, still just missing persons. Correct, yeah. Right. Yeah, so what's, what's interesting about him is the motivation wasn't sexual. Um, it was not the preternatural need for dominance or to get back at anyone like his mother or anything like that. The murders occurred for religious reasons, and that religion, my friends, is voodoo or uh, Santeria. He practiced Santeria. He probably had a crystal ball. Yeah, um, and then specifically, he practiced a uh, form of Santeria. Uh, it's a re- in a relationship to it. It's a uh, it's called Palo Mayambe, 
Uh, nice, nice pronunciation. Yeah, dude. which yeah, uh, or, originated from the African Congo and is uh, said to be the world's most powerful and feared form of black magic. Uh, in the uh, Santeria uh, religion, there exists a dark side called Palo Mayombe. Uh, individuals who practice this dark aspect are called Polero. Palo Mayombe has a very strong, uh, long and historical history. Uh, this magic was transported to the Caribbean during Spanish slave trades to Cuba and Puerto Rico in the 15, uh, 1500s. Interesting. So uh, it, it has like a, um, a really, really long tradition um, along with these uh, Afri- Afro-Cubans, uh, Afro-Caribbean, and even the Afro-Spanish um, because it kind of like also, in my opinion, uh, you know, it, it probably meshed really well with the indigenous person's already superstitions and religious beliefs and stuff like that. Um, but Santer- Santeria is about the light. Yeah, it's about the light. It's good. I and guess. Palo Mayombe is about the dark. Yeah, it, it makes no differentiation between um, black and white magic, you know, as, as it were. Yeah, there's an absolute, like, uh, blending of both. Yeah. No, it's it's, it's kind of interesting. Um, you see a lot of you see a lot of that now. Like if you want to if you want to blend, you know whatever form of religion you want to blend blend. Nobody says anything about it. Like oh, I'm going to grab some of this from Buddhism. I'm going to grab and you see you see this a lot in Japan. Mm-hmm. Um, they'll grab a little bit of Christianity, a little bit of Shinto, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and you know become deeply spiritual, and that's great, and it works for these people. Um, this one sort of takes that and just kind of goes a different route. Right. I feel like he. Uh, Costanzo, Aldolfo Costanzo, basically went to the farthest reaches that this possibly could go. Yeah, he might be the the ultimate witch doctor. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I mean, he honestly deserves. And and in this, we we looked at we looked at a few sources, and we we kind of ran around the internet, watched some videos. There isn't a lot of really super credible information on this, which I think is why we're. Um, not we haven't really heard much about him, right? Like I, I just I just tripped over his name once. I, I typed it. I was typing in a bunch of uh, looking for looking for these. Sometimes I just type in a bunch of different words in a Google search, and I, I happened to type uh, "drug cult leader serial killer" just in a combo, and they, I actually got a result. And I was like, "What?" So, yeah, and I mean, I didn't. Uh, I obviously didn't. I, I may have heard of him like in in passing through other like types of research, etc. But like never really put much thought into it and then when you brought this uh topic up to me i'm like well this is a very interesting story especially where it's where it's located uh geographically what it entails uh physically murder wise uh religion um all of these you know centuria and palo um uh, <laughs> Mayombe, yeah. um all these different aspects along with what's really going on culturally politically and spiritually in in the world at that time, especially in the United States, like the the cross between all of this is just this this story could go we could if we could give it justice and get enough sources, which is unfortunate because there's not that many you, we could do like a, a massive uh story on this whole thing what it what, what it what culturally what it's doing what's going on here, but this is a very interesting look into the absolute dark side of what could happen within the drug trade within uh, with religion, crooked with cops, everything, crooked cops, yeah. politicians, etc. This 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 story runs massively deep, culturally deep, and spiritually deep. It's a it's a very interesting story, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, this is going to be a cool one to to let the people know about. Absolutely, dude. Yeah, I think so too. Um, what's what's interesting about this is this is happening, and I I you know I touched on it for a second. It, it's happening at like the height of the cocaine years. Like we have. We have, at the same time, we have Medi, you know, the rise of Medellin. Uh, we have, we have, you know, the various cartels in Mexico, and we have just a, a vast network of people. And you can watch like a thousand different movies about this, right? There's like a vast network of people flying drugs into the U.S. We're sending guns to Nicaragua. I mean, all this stuff is going on at this time. Right. And this man just is a puzzle piece that just fits right into that larger story. That's that that I found absolutely fascinating. I mean. It's we're sending we're trading guns for cocaine in Nicaragua. Mm-hmm. We're flying we're flying back and forth. To, we got the CIA doing that. We're flying back and forth to, to um, Medellin. We're picking up drugs there. We're dropping drugs off in Nicaragua. We're bringing those into the swamps of Louisiana, and we're shipping those out all over the country. And that's just one movie you can watch that had um, uh, what's his name, Risky Business, um, <laughs> yeah. had Risky Business in it. You know the the Mormon there. Yeah. yeah. 
But uh, that guy, that guy, that but, guy. Uh, what also is going on at this exact moment is a, is a really, really, really like, uh, and I, I don't want to. And the only reason why this is going to shed a bad light on possible, like the whole war on drugs thing, is, is I mean, there's a ton of marijuana, as they say a lot in the documentaries and stuff. Ooh, marijuana. Yeah, marijuana, or I would like to call cannabis, flowing over the border openly. Hmm. Like, there are politicians, people being paid off, and this is the big drug trade in this central area. They're going over the border. This is also a bastion for spring breaking. Yes, yes. Which will play into the story um, oh, yeah. eventually when we get there. Ain't nothing like partying in Mexico. If anybody's, and I highly recommend it, beautiful people, wonderful culture, great food. Uh, the booze flows like like you read about. And at this time in the 80s, you could drink while you were 16 years old down there. 16 years old. So without further ado, let's talk a little bit about Adolfo. Our hero was born 1962 in Miami. Uh, to a 15-year-old Cuban Im- immigrant named Delia Aurora Gonzalez del Valle. And I apologize for my extraordinarily white pronunciation of these things. <laughs> <laughs> Delia Aurora Gonzalez del Valle. Is, I, there you go. Yeah, now I sound like I'm announcing a soccer game. Yeah. Barriaga, Ariaga 2 and Barriaga. She, uh, she was sort of like a petty criminal, um, which, you know, I think given the, her stance situation, that's completely understandable. Right. Um, you know, shoplifting, paper hanging, writing bad checks, uh, theft, and of course, uh, she she was uh, arrested for child neglect. She yeah, well. she almost always got out with uh, parole and never lost custody of Adolfo. So when she wasn't neglecting young Adolfo, <laughs> she was in, involving him in you know her crimes and in obviously her religion. Dave talked about the pa- Paolo Mayombe, or uh, I guess that's right. Paolo Mayombe. Paolo Mayombe. Uh, nice nice pronunciation, Dave. So anyway, um, he and his mom. Moved to Puerto Rico, and by all all accounts, uh, young Adolfo was apprenticed apprentice to a Haitian priest practicing Paolo. He was pretty gifted at this, I guess, um, and the priest expected him to do great things. And some there were some accounts where they were referring to him as, like, the chosen one, which I thought was great. Um, I also think that's great marketing for uh, a priest that's into training, because I'm sure he's not doing it for free. So he says, he says, I got the chosen one. You know, now he's more desirable for his his rituals and stuff like that. It's great marketing if you think right. about it. So prior to actually all of this, and I think I'm not sure if uh, you hit on it at all, but uh, his mother had been like married a couple times. Uh, he had a couple stepfathers. One of his stepfathers was like a real devout Catholic, and as a child, he was baptized as as Catholic. But all the while, his mother was practicing this Palo Mayombe in in, in Santeria behind closed doors, and like she kept him involved with everything religious and like all of her black market dealings as as they were yeah there was an interesting string of men in his life um they didn't stick around very long no because she would somehow basically either end it or move on yeah i I think of the typo negative lyric oh baby lily munster ain't got nothing on you (laughs) yeah yeah and she's a story in and of herself but i guarantee that's lost to the ages absolutely yeah i mean this guy's uh profile has basically trumped anything that his mother could possibly have done she basically was the one who reared this gentleman and then put him in the situation where he became, where he came to met, meet this priest. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And she was all about it, too. <laughs> oh, 100%. Um, a little note on Paolo. We talked about it a bit, but um, the main practice really focuses on the religious, like a religious receptacle or an altar, like in most other religions. Uh, it's known it's as... La Naganga. La Naganga. Thank you, Dave. Uh, <laughs> El Caldero, which... Uh, basically means the cauldron. So it's, it's like the witch's brew, right? Which I'll have an interesting story on the witch's brew uh, later if you feel so inclined. Anyway, this is a, this is a consecrated, uh, consecrated vessel, and it's, uh, it's dedicated to a specific mopungu, or high creator or god. Um, Just to let you know, um, also the Naganga itself, the word Naganga, comes from a, uh, it's like a proto-African language uh, that means spiritual healer or herbalist. So the, the, they're taking that name and then putting it to this vessel where it's basically worked by a spiritual leader or herbalist, and they've perversed it almost into this, this black magic because it's not originating there, but they took the word f- and used it for that. It's a powerful word. Yeah, it, it is. It becomes this, this, this sacred, um, the sacred vessel that is, you know, it's, it's definitely much more than the sum of its parts, right? It's, mm-hmm. it's this, this sacred a microcosm that that is that is power and is is um, 
spirits and it's 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 everything to this religion often it's actually um believed to be inhabited by the spirit of the dead and what's interesting about that is it's, it's almost never a direct ancestor of the of the object's owner that spirit's often referred to as a nefumbe who acts as a guide for all religious activities which are performed with na the naganga um, all the colors, clothing, stylized dances associated with a particular deity, um, which is a common feature of Santeria um, in the Yoruba religion, are not found in Palo. Yeah, Yoruba would be the, uh, the, the religion where all of this was originally found in Africa, the Congo. So basically the short version is, if you want the trait of an animal, the strength of a bull, the speed of a cheetah, um, you have but to put a piece of that animal in this cauldron. The muscles, the fangs, the brain... Uh, perform, a, perform a ceremony. Kalima! 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 Shakti day! And bam, you're fucking Batman. Mm -hmm. that's, that's how this goes. Yeah, it's kind of like um, uh, Black Panther. I don't know if you've seen that yet. I have not. It's on Netflix. Watch it. But no, it, check it out. It's very uh, similar in, in regards to that type of ritual practices. Like, the power of this is in this, so you got to take that. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, truth, truth, truth being definitely stranger than fiction in this case, but you got to borrow from truth to make fiction believable. Well, there are a huge population of people that believe 100% in the powers of either Santeria, uh, voodoo, uh, whatever you want to call it. They believe it, especially down in Mexico and the Caribbean and all the islands and everything down there, dude. It's, it's real. Oh, it, it, it's alive, yeah. I mean, you, you can see that if you if you go on vacation and just leave the area where people are vacationing. Absolutely. Um, and you know that's great. I believe in the power of belief more than more than anything else. Right. Um, if you believe it to be true, then it's true in some in some form, some capacity. Absolutely. So all this dark shit really appealed to drug dealers, crooked cops, politicians, actors, you know, moralist criminals looking for uh, any sort of edge. And while young Adolfo was studying with his voodoo shaman, his mom was performing uh, Palo ceremonies, presumably for money. Uh, and it was either his sorcerer or his mom who gave him the motto that he would actually live his life on, which was, let the non-believers kill themselves with drugs. We will profit from their foolishness. Which kind of is like the motto for uh, most religions, especially devout religions yeah or we'll yeah we'll, we'll provide them with what they need to kill themselves they're they're not worthy it should be a good guideline for you know honestly any drug dealer let 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 them kill themselves with drugs i'm gonna stay away from this and make money on it yeah. it's, it's really that same philosophy which i think is why it tied in so well yeah so adolfo grew up as this young uh palo kid with uh, the blood of animal sacrifices all over the house headless animals all that stuff you know, being a pet cat in his, uh, his house, in the Constanzo house, was probably a stressful and short proposition. <laughs> yeah, I can only imagine. Yeah, the upside, you know, plenty of fresh meat. Right. Uh, downside, the minute the drug dealer wants your cat-like reflexes, into the caldero you go. Yeah, poor cats. Yeah. I like cats. I'm looking for a kitten, by the way. <laughs> okay. Yeah, if, if anyone hears about one, just give me a call. Yeah, hit, uh, hit, hit John, uh, Herman up on the, uh, on the old Facebooks for uh, any uh, you know, cat. Any, you got a, got a hotline. It's a perfect month to get a cat, too. It is, it is. I, I would love a black one that really likes to kill things. Um, anyway, so the uh, neighbors complained uh, eventually to Aurora, you know, and, and I picture a neighbor saying like, hey, um, you know, I happen to notice uh, all the blood and, and, and dead animals and, well, I know you got your thing and everyone's entitled to practice their religion, you know, of their choice here in Puerto Rico, but, but, but damn it, my two-year-old daughter won't even go outside anymore. <laughs> and let's not even talk about what my... My wife, she's so worried about her little schnoodle pug muffin that uh, she won't let the thing leave her side. She showers with the damn thing. It's, it's, it's a little weird. A anyway, you know, if you could cut the blatant animal sacrifice down to a minimum and maybe keep it indoors or even in a tent. <laughs> I just picture her. Miss Bolo Sabim, mas que tu cabron, chingate maricon, tu esposa es una puta. Yeah, um... All right, Aurora. You know, good shot. I think we really cleared things up. And um, yeah. yeah, you know, I feel better. Um, come up to the house on Saturday. We're barbecuing. You could bring a goat, you know, or a chicken or a pig. Lord knows you got enough of that lying around, right? <laughs> so Aurora's response to this sort of line of questioning was quite simple. She would place uh, dead animals, uh, usually just the heads, on uh, people's doorsteps. Yeah. Uh, effective, I think. Yeah, quite effective. Uh, it's like very godfatherish. It did. It did work again. Truth being stranger than fiction. So, I mean, I guess this childhood, Dave, is a little bit different than uh, than most, right? Well, yeah. I mean, everybody has an interesting childhood. I mean, you had your own interesting childhood. I had mine. 
Um, yeah, everybody on the, we could all have a chat about. Uh, right, we could do we could do childhood chats, but uh, there are some people out there that have interesting, sometimes horrific. Maybe they actually enjoyed it. This one, he might have seemed like he enjoyed it because he was giving power at a very young age, uh, because of this, his apprenticeship and all these other things. But other people who end up doing these types of things, not necessarily so uh, so uh, you know blessed in regards to you know maybe being taught these things and being revered for their possible power later on in life but i mean the end result is still mass murder and a few dead bodies <laughs> yeah true and i mean if you look at if you look at any like <coughs> societal norm right we love um and i i was just i was just uh not to not to bring somebody else into this but i was just listening to dan carlin's podcast uh, on one uh, of the greatest yeah yeah absolutely podcasters of all time history buffs i mean he's one of the greatest history writers of all time like i love listening to that man or a any story. Yeah, no, he's, he's fantastic. <laughs> but one of the best orators we have. Um, but he did one called Painfotainment about, yeah, yeah. Uh, about all the uh, um, public executions. And it's interesting. He, he brought up a point that I'm going to steal from him was that, you know, we, we pantomime all that same stuff in all of our, in all of our violent action movies and, oh, yeah. and that sort of thing. And we're fine with it because it's fake and it's on the screen. But people watch this for real and it was acceptable. And I think I look at his childhood as like that, like almost like a Stockholm syndrome. And you know, I'm I'm looking back with absolutely no training in this regard. So right. please, please take this and crumple it up and throw it in the garbage. But he he had he had a certain set of norms that were thrust upon him to the point where he just started to believe that that's how that's how it should be go. And he was a, that that's how life should go. And he was a captive the entire time. Well, I, yeah, one because there's obviously this mutual link to the maternal figure in your family, and especially she's a loving creature. I mean, she may not have put him in the best situations, but I'm pretty sure that she uh, did her best to make sure that he was happy and, and whole, as a mother could do. Um, yeah, granted, there were some, some issues with, you know, the, 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 the authorities and stuff coming in or whatever, but, uh, but like, he just being brought up with the ritual sacrificing and the dark magic and stuff like that will alter your... You're, you're, I mean, it's it's definitely nature versus nurture. There was nurture there. Like True, it's and it, mostly nurture. And he could he could see that it was altering the, their their station. You know, this is how they made their money. Right. Um, I found a psychologist, and my God, I hope this is a real person because I, I couldn't find a whole lot on uh, Doctor Nicole Davis. But Doctor Nicole Davis from Health Psych- Psychology Consultancy noted, and and I, I kind of buy into this that as a child, adult quote as a child. Adolfo is likely to have experienced a sense of isolation and separation from the rest of the world. His world comprised of himself, his mother, and a religion that allowed crime and drug dealing. Not only would he have felt different to everyone else, but he was also prevented from seeing how others live, how other, how other mothers behave, and how children generally are not taught to steal but to play. The impact of this is immense, from giving Adolfo a very narrow view of the world to making it very difficult for him to develop healthy, interpersonal, and relationship skills. This set him up for a lonely childhood and a maladjusted adulthood. Constanzo failed at high school and cruised Miami gay bars in his teens. So I don't love that end statement. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that uh, end statement is just basically, uh, if this was uh, written by a psychological consultant at the time, that just would have been a, 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 a jab yeah. to the gay community. I mean, the, the gay bars had nothing to do with his sickness. The gay bars was just because he was interested in men. Yeah, and that that brings into one of the hurdles that I think both Dave and I found when we were researching this guy was that there's a lot of um cultural norms back then that were are not as prevalent as they are today, I would say. Yeah, uh, one of them would be not accepting of the LGBT community, uh the cultural norm of the war on drugs being the most intense thing we need to fight. And then which we haven't really talked upon on is the 80s satanic panic that is going on at this exact time it's just such a rich tapestry so <laughs> it is a very rich tapestry that and, and again i did not realize exactly what was going on until i started to research we were doing a little research into this that how prolific of a time this was for these two countries yes yeah, it's it's, a, it's an amazing time um and you can tell just by the wealth of media and film and, and documentaries that exist about this time. right you know netflix, netflix has a great documentary on um Oh, what the hell is his name? El Chapo. Yeah. Um, and a bunch of other like yeah. cultists and, and serial killers, etc. Yeah, and Homeboy from Medellin, whose name I can't... Uh, 
a Pablo Escobar. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, and all these guys are, are happening right now. So Adolfo did move back to the U.S. from Puerto Rico, and he he, he as a teenager he pledged himself to uh, Cadiem Pembe. Dave, Dave, work on that. I think it would be Cadiem Pepe. Yeah, like it's a weird like Cadiem Pepe. Basically, it's like the voodoo Satan, <laughs> um, which I think the voodoo Satan's probably kind of a badass. Um, yeah, anyway, voodoo Satan, uh, it's like a weird, like a, Satan is just Satan and voodoo is voodoo. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Anyway, so he, he began, he sort of began his life of crime at that point. His mother was actually quite proud of him. He was said to have been a psychic and able to predict a number of world events, such as the uh, botched assassination attempt on Ronald Reagan. Uh, I'm going to say that's just, uh, you know, yeah, obviously this is from third party sources. So yeah, again, I don't know if he predicted it or not, but that's, that's what they say. So what they say and what they believe, Dave. A modeling assignment took, uh, the handsome young sorcerer to Mexico city in 1983. He was a, he's a, he's a dashing young, I mean, he's pretty, I mean, for the time, (laughs) late eighties, like looks he was pretty pretty spectacular yeah he does have a flowing camaro cut but and you can uh, see why people were in for like would would back him up like a like a david koresh type of thing or like just a handsome fellow who people would be like yeah i, I think would, i, I think would follow was, this guy into I whatever think he was hotter he than david do. koresh yeah. yeah or yeah or charlie manson back in the day or yeah Man- manson got f- weird looking but yeah <laughs> um i guess i guess years of prison and i'm sure he had a charisma about him yeah yeah oh yeah no. charisma Carisma, machismo. <laughs> he goes to Mexico on a modeling gig. He spends his free time telling uh, fortunes with uh, tarot cards in the city's infamous Zona Rosa. And I actually didn't have to look this up to translate it. Tran- <laughs> translate it. It means red zone. Yeah, pretty yeah, much. Zona, zone, Rosa, red. It's kind of like Maybe. Baton Rouge. The, Baton Rouge. The red stick. The red stick. Yeah. And I may have actually done a poor job, but. Who cares? Because uh, Rojo means, means red. So it might be the Rose Zone. Which sounds nice, but yeah. like the Rose Bowl. I have no idea. But anyway, <laughs> it's probably a nice place. Um, Adolfo collected a couple of uh, lovers with whom he uh, with whom he lived, and uh, flew back to Miami with a host of uh, beautiful young Mexican sorcerers. So did he basically take these 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 men in, under his wing as like uh, apprentices? Basically? Uh, apprentices, lovers, um, sort of a little column A, column B. There was there was two two uh, two guys that he really. He really loved. He called one of them his man and one of them his woman. I, based on, I guess the gender identity. The, yeah, or the mood of the evening, or, yeah, cool. or whatever. Yeah. Either way, I don't know. Um, good for him. I, I'm, I'm, I'm married to one person, and I don't really think that adding anybody else into it would would simplify matters. Any. No, it sounds I, like a lot of work to me. I, I'm like I tell Rachel all the time. I don't have enough time for anybody else. Yeah. Nor nor would I even consider it. It's like this is this is enough. I'm I'm 100 okay with what's going on. There's no way that I want anything else, because again, it's a fucking chore. Life is a chore, and like you're like you've already got it full of full of everything. I I love you. Why would I want to fucking go somewhere else? But yeah. but I mean, hey, hey, man, if you're free and, and want to do all this, that's that's wonderful. Good for good these for guys. You. I mean, they were young too. So I mean, we're we're speaking from a uh, we're retired at this point. I guess forty <laughs> ish. <laughs> yeah, forties and forty ish. It yeah. really sneaks up on you. You get very lame very quickly, and it's fine. Yeah, we need a, a young Forrest perspective at this point. We do. It's very old in here. Um, <laughs> miss you, Forrest. Anyway, so um, yeah, so he, you know, they 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 swing around uh, Miami for a little bit, but Adolfo sort of, I think. And nobody says this, but I feel like he figures out what side of uh, the bread, the bread's buttered on. I really don't know how the phrase goes. What side the butter is breaded. Um, he breads his butter and decides to move <laughs> to uh, Mexico City full time. What John is trying, or what Herman is trying to say at this point is uh, he's figured shit out. Yeah, he's got, he got his shit together he, in, in Miami. He, he knows what he needs to do to make a large amount of money and to have a large amount of power. And it's uh, this dark sorcery. I think the love, love and adoration of two people was probably enough to get him to uh, really sort his shit out fast. Yeah. So he collects a he he moves to Mexico City and just immediately starts to collect a bunch of followers. And he not only collecting followers, but he also starts to get paid by uh, drug dealers, uh, politicians, etc. Now, just as a, as a backup, just to let you know, a uh, a part of what he is uh, uh, when he practices, uh, or is it Apollo? Apollo, pa- yeah, yeah Apollo. Apollo um, is when he's practicing this. He cannot go out and seek people. People come to him. Yeah, you can't talk about Fight Club, right? 
it's a, it's a, it's a fight club type of thing where, um, so these people are actually coming to him from word of mouth and we're not talking just regular day people. We're talking the biggest cartel members. Like he's got into situations where there were cartels fighting over him. Yeah. He's and like, I mean, and like not, uh, politicians and not just politicians at this point, but like really powerful people putting their name behind this man. Oh yeah, there was there was he was well well loved in the underground of Mexico, and the underground always. In this point, and he's, he's he's in Florida at this point, and he's building a name. No, he's back in Mexico. Oh, is he at this point? Yeah, so he he builds a name in Florida, but he, it, Florida wasn't wasn't as as much of like a, a cakewalk as Mexico was because Mexico is designed for especially Mexico City. You go to the center of Mexico City, and you have an Aztec temple, right? And that I, that's in the air and the water and the history of the land. Like you don't you don't lose that, right? Right, right. So in, in this this uh, in Mexico, down where he's at at this point, people are really heavily enriched in the spirituality that he's bringing. Yeah, correct. No, like he's 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 selling, he's selling. And like any good businessman, he keeps a journal of the services that are rendered and the costs that are paid. Right. I mean, you know, you you have to. So he he's he's in fortune telling. You know, predicting the future. Um. Performing limpas, uh, which is the cleaning of houses of evil spirit, uh, which is kind of a nice trick for someone who pledged himself to the Palo Dark Lord. Oh, yeah. Who could probably kick Christian pitchfork Satan's pointy red-tailed ass, <laughs> I think. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, their, their evil is a little bit more, like, evil. <laughs> I mean, capital E-V-I-L. Than the 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 pussy Satan and and I'm using the word pussy as in pusillanimous person of weak character. He's a pussy. Oh, he might have eternity to do this, but these demons, not so much. I mean, they're 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 there to destroy your soul for that instant and forever. Was was was, <laughs> was pusillanimous Latin or is that like a breed of fish? <laughs> it's a Latin. It's a Latin. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, dropping some knowledge, Dave. Pusillanimous. That's yeah. where the word pussy comes from. It's not because of a vagina. Because vagina is the strongest fucking thing on the planet. Yeah, they they, they stretch without breaking. <laughs> <laughs> to put it simply, yes, John. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I like I like simple things. So uh, Constanzo had a whole menu of prices for uh, the an animal sacrifices that he uh, would perform for discerning drug dealers. Uh, he would charge up to forty five hundred dollars for a single ceremony, which was kind of amazing. So you got your roosters for six dollars. <laughs> Want a goat? That's going to be thirty. Yep. Uh, now your boa constrictors are a little more expensive at four hundred and fifty dollars because it's getting harder to come by. Uh, Petco's been asking some questions. Yep. So he kind of had to pay some homeless people, give them a bottle of Ripple and a pack of smokes to buy the uh, boas for him. Now an adult zebra is going to set you back about eleven hundred bucks. And uh, this is the saddest one right here. Dude. If you need some, this one really, really really broke my heart when I, when I found out about this one. Yeah, if you need some real magical souse, <sighs> we can do it up. Uh, an African Lion Club at $3,100 each. It's a baby lion, everybody. Yeah. My spirit animal. Oh, well. It's sad. Yeah, I guess But that... it's very, power, very, power, very, very, very powerful uh, voodoo. Juju, I guess. Juju, as they say. I guess, but I mean, an African Lion Cub? I'd want, like, a full-grown lion. Like, take that thing down. Anyway, I don't know. Maybe not. The future power and, and you know, oh, good lord. Yeah, it's, it's right up there with rhinoceros horn. Okay, so <laughs> Constanza really targeted the, uh, the drug dealers. Um, occultism and brujaria are important in Mexico, and brujaria is another um, religion kind of along these lines. It and is, um, it's basically just another uh, form of santeria. Um, brujaria is uh, it's just along those lines that it's just one of those things culturally in that that specific area. There's a lot of people who do that. Then there's the Santeria. Then there's the the Palo Muerte, uh, you know, whatever that is. Yeah, Palo Mayombe. Yeah. Um, it's just one of those things that because there's a lot of those types of religions. There's Christianity involved down in this area, obviously, but there's those sub cultural religions. Like a lot of these people will go to church, but also practice Santeria. Or all these other things. Oh, yeah, and they've altars to the <clears throat> dead and stuff like that. I mean, it's it's interesting. Yeah. But it, the more comfortable you are with the dead and death, the more comfortable you are with being alive. So, I mean, it's they're they're lively. Right? Yeah, and I, I mean, well, that's the thing. Is I like, want to go so When bad. you accept death as uh, an absolute, then you no longer fear death, and you can actually live in the moment. That's what the majority of these cultures are about, which is basically the, the, the true tenets of life. Forget about the one thing that's going to happen to you so that you can live right now. 
Yeah, it's the elephant in the room, right? I right. mean, it's, it's in every it's in everybody's um, room right now. America is so obsessed with death. That's that's all we think about. We we let our ego drive it, and we let death get in the way of living in the moment. That's the one thing that we can't do as a culture, as a society in America, is do that. So are you scared to live or afraid to die? <laughs> I'm pretty sure that most people are scared to live. I said that to some asshole that was like, I can't, I can't believe you ride a motorcycle. They're so dangerous, blah blah blah. And I was just like, I was just like, reached back, and that's what I pulled in. And the guy's like, No, oh, fuck you, man. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> Constanzo. Uh, <clears throat> with, with all with all this action, Constanza really targeted those drug <clears throat> dealers, right? I mean, occultism, bruharia, all that stuff we are, are really important, and drug dealers just might be a little suspicious. Um, and by that, I actually meant superstitious. They might be a little superstitious. It's a high stress job, right? You're constantly looking over your shoulder. Um, so Adolfo sort of helped them you know, organize their spiritual house, right? right? He helped them schedule shipments. He helped them schedule meetings on the basis of his predictions. Uh, he offered magic that would make the dealers and their hitmen invisible to police and uh, bulletproof against their enemies. It is said that one dealer paid Constanzo and his followers $40,000 for three years of his services. He wasn't actually just doing this just for the drug dealers, though. He was actually doing this for the, 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 the police, too. Yes. At this point. Oh, yeah. Oh, everybody. Everybody. Everybody, and we'll, we'll we'll talk a minute about about his uh, his his book when they find it. But he really liked working with the drug dealers. That was his jam. Well, I think it was his jam ever since he was a kid, though. Yeah, well, that's what he knew. Right. That those were his people. Those were the people who brought bread to his table when he was a kid. You know, so you kind of like you would gravitate. I think totally towards him. It's like a gangster, like an Italian mobster, drav- gravitates towards the or kid who grows up near the mob will idolize the mob and then go towards them. You know, like specifically. Yeah, and you know they're never going to go to the police. No. <laughs> Fucking snitches get stitches, bro. That's right. <laughs> Talk shit, get hit. Yeah, what, what? <laughs> so now to impress the drug dealers, <laughs> you kind of have to offer a little something special. You know, a little showmanship. Mm-hmm. So he started to call himself El Padrino, or The Godfather, which is an inter- interesting choice at this time, because I believe those movies were quite popular. Um, and he and his followers started raiding graveyards for human remains. He put the bone, bones in his very, uh, his very own naganga. Very good job, John. Um, very well. You know, the little blood the cauldron. Ca- cauldron altar thing, the Pio, Palo Mayambe-like. I would suggest uh, possibly just uh, either YouTubing or Googling uh, this so that you can get a reference for this, this uh, one specific one that we're going to end up getting to eventually, but like what it officially looks like after when they find it and then... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we, we, it, yeah. We, we'll have links to all that stuff, because it, it definitely, anything we, we use to build, and I think people should look at, it's, it's interesting. So, yeah, so throw the human bones in, and now it's looking, it's looking scary. Add some scorpions and spiders and shit, and you've <laughs> got everybody's attention. <clears throat> now, so this is all happening in the mid-80s, uh, mid, uh, right? Like 1986, 87, he's mm-hmm. building up this, this massive... Yeah, Empire, we're, basically. we're walking through the 80s, yeah. right? We're, 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 I think we're going to peak right around 80, 87, 89. So all this mystery kind of attracted a whole bunch of people, right? A physician, a uh, real estate spec- speculator, fashion models, um, several several transvestite nightclub performers. Can we call them trans? Or, I'm not supposed to. I'm sorry. Yeah. Several trans nightclub performers, cops, four members of the federal ju- judicial police joined Constanzo's cult in Mexico City. One of them, Salvador Garcia, was a commander in charge of narcotics investigations. Another, Florentino Ventura, retired from the Federales to lead the Mexican branch of Interpol. I've got a, um, a, a thing here that says, in, uh, by 1986, Costanzo had amassed considerable wealth. He was able to buy a fleet of luxury cars and a $60,000 condominium in Mexico City. During this time, police believe Constanza began to feed his cauldron with human offerings, according to their records. Authorities say he and his cult were responsible for at least 23 ritual murders at this time. So while he's building this mass amount of, of people but underneath him, all these people like coming up against him, he's actually killing these, uh, these people or at least starting this this build up or this ramp up to this uh, this area. Yeah, and and at that time he actually got in with uh, the Calzada cartel. <laughs> oh yeah. So this is a power car- powerful cartel in the late 1980s, um, and they were kind of attracted to his uh, sort of 
human sacrifice is being added to his collection of services, right? Yeah, I mean, I mean they, these, these people were brutal people to begin with. And this type of witch doctor, they were like, oh, yeah, let's get on this. So what I found was that 23 ritual murders are known to have been uh, fed to his Nagana. And uh, according to, I found an article in something called Murderpedia. So please consider the source, but it looks like they did some good research. Mexican authorities point to a rash of unsolved mutilation slayings around Mexico City and elsewhere, suggesting that Constanzo's known victims may only represent the tip of a malignant ice, iceberg, end quote. Right, and I, I heard a tale from one of the the people who were there who were there for the original s- sacrifice that they that, that they needed a young boy so they went out and they just grabbed a young boy off the road right and while they were ready to well they were slitting this kid's throat for the sacrifice he screamed and um Adolfo uh, Costanzo said no it's not going to work he's tainted the ritual because he screamed it's no longer going to be valid and he th- they threw the kid out Got another kid. Fucking this kid didn't scream. That one worked. I, I heard that that's how the f- first ritual killing at this point went down. What's interesting about that is as it progressed, it was all about the pain. Because he had, he had one where he killed, he, he's alleged to have killed the person, and they didn't scream or react negatively. Right. And because of that, the ritual was ruined. So it's all about... It's all about what that's, exactly is needed with the magic with, with at that time right. that's that's interesting now cons- now the cartel the cartel loved costanzo's new all in style and costanzo loved them back uh, he even tried to become an official member of the cartel um he was refused <laughs> kind of a creepy bastard to have around i would think were those the the, the Cal- calzada the calzada uh crime family that refused him yes yes yeah. so this crime family, the cartel and six of his leaders, uh, turned up dead. <laughs> Not just dead. Not just dead. Mexican authorities fished them from the Zompango River. Uh, the bodies were mutilated. Uh, fingers, toes, ears were removed. Um, hearts and sex organs were excised. Uh, one body was missing its spine, while two others were found without brains. Where did all the parts go, Dave? Where did all the parts go? <laughs> The cauldron. Yeah, the cauldron. So, Constanzo believed that to appease certain dark spirits, the victim had to suffer. Now, he quickly got in with a new cartel, and he bought a ranch in Matamoros, Mexico, which is right on the other side of Brownville, Brownsville, Texas. Uh, he'd split his time between uh, Mexico City, City and this, uh, this ranch operation. So he now had multiple calderos to feed. And feed them, Voldemort did. Yeah, Voldemort. He's a, that's a good uh, example of uh, a character. Yeah, we, we were talking offline, and, and it, quite frankly, these spiritual vessels that he has are, the Nagunga. are, are very much where he gets his power. And now he's, he's splitting them between two areas, so those two areas he has to go. And in the ranch, he's, he's moving a lot of product. They're, they're, they're selling marijuana. A lot of marijuana. Um, they're shipping that right over the border into Texas, hence its proximity to the U.S. No, I do want to let you know, um, in the context of this story, uh, the majority of the people are extremely uh, villainizing the fact that it's marijuana. It, it, it doesn't matter that it's marijuana. It could have easily been coke or heroin at this point. But just to let you know, the, 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 <clears throat> the war on drugs is heavy at this point, and we could go into a whole cultural thing as, as to why, but uh, marijuana is being villainized completely in this story, as is uh, at the time, obviously, the, the war on drugs is, is, it is what it is, and we unfortunately, you know, this substance gets demonized. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of <laughs> um, prejudice that's involved in this story uh, from the the uh, drug users, um, drug drug dealing, um, to even just like the L- LBGTQ community, right. like the whole the whole nine, like this this is rife with that sort of thing. So he's work he's working out of this ranch, and then on March thirteenth, nineteen eighty nine, a pre med student by the name of Mark Kilroy goes missing. So I told you that Brownsville, Texas, is right across the uh, the U S border from Mexico, um, and that's the border with Matamoros. And as, as we all know, and we talked about earlier, the drinking age in the U.S. is 21. In Mexico, it's 16. So every spring break, college kids would drive down to Brownsville, park their cars, walk across a bridge across the border to uh, rip it up in Mexico, binge drink, high five, ride mechanical bulls, get VD, buy illicit substances. And then when the debauchery was complete, 
they would walk back across the bridge into Texas and head back to school. It actually sounds like a hell of a lot of fun to me. Well, it definitely was a lot of fun. And the, the interesting thing about Texas is the majority of the schools, actually, I think most of the schools, if not all of them at that time period, shut down for the same exact week. Like, spring break week was a, is a huge thing in Texas. It's, it's a huge thing everywhere. I mean, we had, we, had, we had spring weekend. Our school would just turn a blind eye and let us do whatever we wanted to do so that we were kind of staying home. It's like getting drunk with mom and dad. Right, and these kids were let loose to go to Mexico, Louisiana... Like all these f- crazy fun places, um, and especially on the border, I can you know at this time, this time of year when spring break was happening, it's chaotic and things can happen. Yeah, people go missing. Absolutely, as in the case of this this young young gentleman. So Mark was walking back uh, from you know an evening's revelry with his friends, told him he needed to take a whiz. Um, <laughs> so he went off into the bush- bushes, and effectively he never returned. Uh, you see, the witch king of Matamoros, our boy Constanzo, wanted a new sacrifice, one with a brilliant medical mind, and all he had to do was put his cult members on the trail. He had them sit in the clubs and bars and listened, waiting for their mark. And they found him. 48 hours later, which shocked me, the friends finally go to the police. Uh, specifically, they bumped into this guy, George Gavito, who was sort of an American super cop working a lot of over the borders type of cases in Mexico. Um, and a lot of stuff dealing with these kids. And there's a great 40 minute documentary from his perspective that's available on YouTube. And we'll put the link up for you. Absolutely worth a watch. And it's a, it's really about the investigation of Mark Kilroy's murder. At the time the video was filmed, they uh, referred to him as John because they were trying to keep his name out of the papers. Yeah. I'm putting his name back in cause you can find it in, in Wikipedia. So I figured it's n- no longer a secret. I've got, a, I've got a little uh, section here, and this is kind of perfect. It, it plays into the whole thing here. It says, Costanzo scheduled another ritual killing for March 13th, 1989, in order to ensure the safe passage of a shipment of illegal drugs. The victim's suffering, however, wasn't significant for Costanzo. They must die screaming, he insisted, telling the cult members that he wanted the American student for his next ritual. The group lured 21-year-old Mark Kilroy an affluent American student, to the van. When the young man tried to escape, the group bludgeoned him in the back of the head with a machete. The group was elated by the sacrifice. Kilroy's death, however, would turn out to be the fatal error for Adolfo Costanzo. Ooh, nice. Yeah. So, after this fatal error, our, our boy Gavito in, in uh, the U.S. <laughs> went to his Mexico counterpart. Counterpart, excuse me, I got a little Massachusetts-y there. Yeah, counterpart. His counterpart. It was a, he was a commandante named Juan Benitas Ayada. Um, and Ayada is sort of a larger-than-life kind of figure. Um, I, Gavito actually referred to him as being short, you know, short, just over five feet, but said no matter where he was, he was eight feet tall. Right. He was, a, he was a, a very powerful man with a lot of stature and a lot of pull and a lot of, you know, political pull, cultural pull, street pull. He knew a lot of people. He was a very powerful man. He yeah. may not have been a big man, but he was a big man. Yeah, he had a big shadow. Yeah. Um, and, and it was said that he, he didn't go to um, restaurants or bars or anything like that. He worked and he went home. And that's because he put a lot of high-powered people behind bars and was just constantly looking over his shoulder. Again, a real, you know, super cop, I guess. Yeah. So when Gavito went to his uh, his commandante, they offered a reward for twenty five thousand. Uh, sorry, twenty thousand dollars for you know for Mark, Mark Mark's whereabouts, whatever they could get. And this is a huge amount of money back in uh, nineteen eighty nine. Yeah, it was thousand dollars. It was good. It didn't get people's attention. No, you know? but it'd be, it's such a chaotic thing, and a lot of people wouldn't actually open their mouths for this type of thing. I don't think. So fast forward a little bit. Their search is sort of fruitless, and then something interesting happens. Uh, the Comandante arrests a guy by the name of Serafin Hernandez. And what he did was he drove through a police road roadblock without stopping. <laughs> uh, you see, he believed he was invisible. Also that he was bulletproof. So he he rips through this, he rips through this uh this blockade and they were looking for drugs. It was just a just a standard stop, kind of like they look for drunks in America by uh you know, stopping you on the, the weekend. Right. But he believed he was invisible, and he believed he was bulletproof, and he was also carrying 20, 250 pounds of marijuana in his car. Yeah, it, I guess what happened is uh, it was as if they stumbled um, on April 
first, 1989, after Garcia, Surf and Hernandez Garcia, refused to stop at a police checkpoint, officers followed the petty criminal to Rancho Santa Elena, which is the ranch, the name of the ranch that uh, uh, he has. Um, after a quick search uh, in, uh, of the property revealed illegal narcotics, the police arrested him, and they ended up in, this, in, his, in their possession. Yeah, they also arre- arrested a caretaker of the ranch as well mm-hmm. and brought him back to the station. So it was actually the caretaker who kind of blew the whole case up. Um, he looked at the commandante's desk, and there was a picture of, uh, of, of Mark. And he said, quote, I know him. Mm-hmm. So the commandante asked, how do you know him? And this, the caretaker re- responds, I kidnapped him. I gave him bread and untied him. Actually, I think that's he. I don't. I don't know necessarily. Know. He he might have been part of the kidnapping, but he he basically was the one that just fed him and took care of him. Yeah, he worked. He period. worked. He worked yeah. at the ranch and he helped the dude out. So uh, the commandante Ayada asked, "Where is he?" At that point, this dude gives up the ranch. Yeah, and uh, uh, he gives up the ranch, but also Garcia at this point does too. Like, because Garcia is. He literally feels like he's invincible. Like nothing that he says, no matter what it is, how revealing. He believes that he's truly going to be protected and that somebody's about to come in and swoop him away because that's what um, Costanzo had done to his followers to make them believe that he was the, the, the most powerful being in the planet. Yeah, he's he invincible to bullets, yeah. Absolutely. So they go, they grab, they, they, they grab Seraphin, and uh, the commandante calls Gavito in America and says, you, you know, basically, you're not going to believe this, get your ass down to Mexico. So Gavito and the Comandante and Seraphin all go to the ranch. And what they found was actually kind of gruesome and shockingly well documented in this, in this uh, video. You know, in a 1980s Sony Handycam sort of way. Yeah, as best as possible. What they found was the cauldron. It was filled with human remains and blood. So the Comandante looks at, uh, at Seraphin and says, where's the body? Now Seraphin being, like, shockingly matter of fact, says, which body? <laughs> yeah. To which the commandante, like, he literally loses his shit. He's like, he's like, you know, are you, are you messing with me? Which body? Um, he actually, at one point, and you can watch this on the video, fires a machine gun up in the air. Like, oh, you think you're bulletproof? And just rips a clip right up into the sky. And this sort of snaps Seraphin. And Seraphin gets super cooperative. So he, he basically says... You can well, you can watch it in the video where his eyes just literally just open up and go, oh, this shit is real. Yeah, shit just got real. Yeah, because I mean, like he again at this point was he just absolutely thought he was untouchable. He thought he was a part of this uh, this this organization that no one, God, man, or otherwise, could touch. And he was just basically giving all this information out for free because again he thought he was. But this time. When he heard the commandant basically just unload an entire clip of a uh, AK-47. It was a Uzi, but yeah. Uzi, same, yeah, well, not the same thing, but <laughs> yeah, I could I get a lot of people that would yell at me for that. But yeah, the, yes, the gunnies will lose their mind, but yeah, it's, it's loud and, and fast. A full fucking clip, a full banana clip. He just unloaded the whole thing, and then all of a sudden, his Garcia's eyes just all wide open. It was like, oh, oh yeah, okay, so this is where he's buried... This is where somebody else is yeah, buried. Yeah, he's, this basi- is he's basically there. like, "All right, silly." I'm yeah. not saying I'm not saying which body. Like, I'm stonewalling you. I'm saying like there are so many. <laughs> which particular body are we referring yeah, exactly. to here? It's you completely nonchalantly too. He, yeah. with zero emotion. Like, no this emotion. Is okay. Like, yeah, that's a body over there. That's another one over there. Oh, I'm not really sure exactly who's there, but there's a body there. It's like it's like listening to your to your your <coughs> cell phone give you GPS directions. <laughs> yeah. All right, Wazy, thanks for giving me a, a the left. Yeah, there's a left upcoming. Yep. Yeah. So he, he leads him he leads him to where Kilroy was buried, and what's interesting is how he knew. So there's a wire sticking out of the ground. It's a coat hanger, as they say in the video. Yeah. Like and oh, there's a. He's like over over there with a the wire. The coat hanger is hanging out. He's like fucking coat hanger. It's like, yeah, yeah, coat hanger. Why? They say Why? That? Yeah, it's connected to it's connected to Mark Kilroy's spine. Ugh. You see, Constanza wanted to make the boy's spine into a necklace, which is again more of the powerful magic. You have a part of the body, the youth, the the the. I mean, they wanted his brain for the ritual, but they Costanza wanted the rest of his power. What if he was the predator? Hmm. Hmm. Very very well could have been. He could have been some sort of alien creature. Yeah. But no, he's a human being, unfortunately. So basically, what what 
what he goes on to say is that Kilroy was tortured. And uh, the recount of Kilroy's death on the video is extraordinarily matter of fact. I mean, every, no question goes unanswered. He mentioned that Kilroy had tape over his eyes, that he was tortured. Um, they also recounted the kidnapping. You see, these guys dressed as cops found this drunk American kid and said, hey, listen, you're under arrest, public intoxication. Now, they're all dressed. They got badges. Um, they've got red lights on their car, the whole nine. So they, they convince this kid they're the police, and he, he being, you know, a dutiful sort, goes and gets arrested. Mm -hmm. They go to transfer him from one vehicle to the next, and he actually gets away. Yeah, there's, and, a, there's, a, there's a chance, there's a, there's a moment where he had... And I think, according to this video that we both watched, he was literally a hundred yards away, one 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 block away yeah, from freedom to field. that to that main street where all these all this thing was happening. He could see he could see salvation, and they yelled "freeze." And being a, a white, I mean, a good good boy from America who who trusts laws and authorities, when you hear the word "freeze," you fucking freeze. Yeah, or you think you might get shot in the back. Either right. way, either way, yeah. Either way, homeboy freezes. They capture him, and you know, that's that. That, as they say, is that I guess. Yeah, as the story is told, uh, he was basically then, again, fed, kept captive, and eventually was part of a ritual sacrifice. So our American cop friend looks at uh, the commandante and says, "Hey, listen, you got a bunch of these guys in in jail, and they 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 grabbed a whole bunch of people that were associated with uh, Seraphim, and." They do the smart thing. They get him out there. They commandeer a uh, a, um, a tractor, like a tractor, yeah, a backhoe to start digging and start digging. And, and like there's video of of after when they've pulled all of these bodies. I counted, I think eight or nine, maybe ten or twelve. Like they hadn't fully picked up all of, I guess, the sixteen or maybe eighteen or twenty bodies. That fifteen. Were there. They found fifteen according to the. But source. like when you look at the video and they're they, they've got the four guys who they had dig up. The bodies at this point just standing there. They're all looking there. They're talking about it nonchalantly. And they're yeah, they're like, like over is, there. This and, is oh, this over person. There. and then laid in front of them are, f are like 10, 12 bodies. Just human remains, yeah, and in various different states of decay. It's a very gruesome scene. I mean, f coming from a very human perspective to see this and to just think about that they're basically piecemealed for this Nagunga for individual powers in different rituals. Whether it was for Costanzo himself or for these rich politicians and drug lords. Yeah. And, and what's interesting is among the victims, there were rival narcotics dealers, children. Yep. Uh, two renegade federal narcotics off officers, Joaquin Manzo and Miguel Garcia, along with three men who were absolutely never identified. Yeah, I mean, missing persons. These could have just been your vagrant or your, your teenage boy young Mexican boy just, you know, is a street vagrant who doesn't really have a home or, you know, whoever, etc. It's just like, you know, lost souls. Somebody who just got wrapped up in or caught up in the wrong thing. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, happenstance, you know. Or just picked up off the street because they needed somebody with brown hair. I don't know. I don't know how this <laughs> thing works. But yeah, at this point, you know, obviously we're on, we're on Constanzo's ranch. We're digging up his bodies. So we're going to go look for him in Mexico. Yeah. I mean, well, because at this point, they basically gave up. Um, Mexico says, City, I should have said, <clears throat> not Mexico. We're in Mexico the whole time. Right. So um, it says right here, it said, uh, on April 11th, 1989, Hernandez took police to the ranch, unearthing the remains of 15 victims. One of the bodies was Mark Kilroy's. Uh, his brains was, were missing. His body dismembered. Garcia told law enforcement officials about the group's leader, Alfonso, Alf, 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 Aldolfo Costanzo, at this point. Basically, at this point is when they realized who was behind all of this. Yep. Literally. So it took up to this point for them to realize that there was a whole organization of people behind this mass grill. And, um, I'll, I'll, um, and probably described his involvements in the ritual sacrifice. Um, so once word got out to Costanzo, Costanzo basically kind of, kind of went under the run, uh, on the run, went on the lam, on the run. Yeah, under the radar, whatever right. you were saying. Um, yeah. Cassandro had disappeared by this time, hiding out in uh, the houses of various cult members, uh, making plans to flee Mexico. There's loose reports that he made it as far as Chicago, but how the hell did he get back to Mexico? Right. Like, there's you no, know, like, there's, there's, this guy was everywhere and nowhere. It's so right. spotty. 
is that uh, more and more of the cult's members were being arrested by May 6th of uh, 1989 at this point. Uh, while police were going door to door on an unrelated case, they stumbled upon Costanzo. But here's the thing. That, right, that verbiage right there is wrong. From the word of people who were actually involved with this, uh, including in that video, I got word that, so we're on the trail of Costanzo at this time. Like, we, like we're like a week in, week and a half, two weeks in. They get really desperate. And the Comandante down in Mexico hires his own brujaria or witch doctor or, as you would want to say, and basically what he says is his power is in that Nagunga. You have to burn burn the shack. F- dang, yeah. You have to burn that shack. You have to burn his Naganga. You have to burn the power that that gives him this 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 power, this black magic. Which if you think about it, it is its own magic ritual, right? You're you're burning from a strictly almost computer like standpoint, you're burning evidence. Right. You're destroying evidence of a crime. This is incredible too, because I was thinking about it from a forensics point of view. I'm like, you were literally burning all of your evidence. Yeah. Granted, they had taken samples, they had taken this, they had done that, they had taken bone, everything that they could do forensically, I think that they had already done it, photo, video, because it's all, this is all documented on video. You can see the thing on the video, and it's creepy, there's a bunch of sticks in there, and it, Those aren't sticks, and... that's a lot of, those are bones and ribs. And... Oh shit, there's a bunch of stuff that looks like sticks that are bones and ribs? <laughs> yeah, dude. Man, I'm, I'm so naive. Yeah, th- that, um, those are bones, dude, those are, those are rib bones, those are leg bones, those are, those are ritualistic pieces of that, because you don't. You just add to it. You don't take away. It's all so fucked up looking yeah. that it's just hard to figure out what it is. 100%. Oh, gross, man. Yeah, so um, at this point, apparently, and again, this, this might be hearsay or conjecture, but this is what happens is that uh, the Comandante reaches out to the uh, Brownsville uh, sheriff there. Uh, do you, I forget his name. Um, but he, he, he basically tells him, hey, we're going to do this. This is what I've... Gavito. Uh, yeah, Gavito. This is what we're going to happen. This is what's going to happen. You're going to come down. We're all going to witness this. They fucking go to the shack on uh, at the ranch. Um, what was the name of that ranch again? Oh, uh, uh, Santa uh, Rancho Santa Elena. That sounds so nice. Rancho sounds, Santa Elena sounds like yeah. a good place to like yeah, sit by like, the beach. And so they a... go down to the ranch. They gather up all. They gather up the shed. They gather up all the 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 nagunga. They gather it all up and they fucking on video. They pour gasoline on everything, and then they take that video. It's burning. Everything is burning up. The video uh, is shown on national television in the news. Yeah, it's crazy. They're totally fighting fire with fire. Instantly, they get a call to this random place. And again, they they says right here that it was uh, stumbled upon him. They may have stumbled upon him, but they got tons of calls from this one person in this one building freaking out over this. And the Comandante, knowing full well that this was going to bring him out, brought him out instantly. Yeah, I mean, you're going to find you have really good luck if you uh, play your cards right, you know? Right. There's, a little bit of, there's a little bit of that. Like, oh, he had great luck, except for he played, he played well. Yeah, and as you were saying, absolutely, he played his cards right in this situation. Uh, the Comandante, dude, like, he knew that his power was there. And, and by destroying this, this, this cauldron, this Naganga, he was going to fucking come out and he was going to go nuts. As, as we brought up earlier, Voldemort. Voldemort, yeah. Like, yeah. this was basically one of his horocruxes. This was, this was part of his soul, his who he was. You know, and that type of, like, I mean, if you believe in it or not believe in it, like, that type of magic, that black magic, you have to give part of your soul They, they, be, they beat him with his own magic. <laughs> right. that's, I mean, that's, that's really what it is. Like, as you're talking about it, all of this, all of this black magic, they used black magic to capture a black magician. Right. That's fantastic. Yeah, and it wasn't... backburning. It wasn't, like, sleuthing. It wasn't... I mean, you have to... You have to... You you have to give credit where credit is due. The Commandant and the the Sheriff over there in in Brownsville were really hard working this case. All these disappearances, all this stuff, they were really wanting to find this gentleman. They really wanted to get behind this because, again, it worked both into the, the war on drugs... And like we were saying before, it heavily worked into the satanic panic that was going on in the, in the 80s at this time, which we could honestly do a two or three part series on in general. But there are people out there that have already done a wonderful job. Oh, there's, there's so Including much, last yeah. podcast, etc. Go check those out. But you really should look into the satanic panic at that time. And, you know, there are other places out there to look into the war on drugs. But these were really interesting times back then. And they both, this whole situation played into all of that culturally. But what they did 
They didn't use policing. They used... Black magic. His own black magic. Yeah. To capture this fucker. Well, not even to capture him. Just, we'll get just into to, that. Just, just to, you know, flush him out. Like, like game. Right. No, and, and, and what they ended up doing is, again, they got a call to this building uh, where this gentleman, this person, was freaking out. And lo and behold, it happened to be Costanzo. But here's where the story gets weird. Yeah, it's really spotty, too, and different regard, regarding whoever's reporting it at the time. Right, because so there's one instance where the, this is what the police say. They went in, and they found him, and he had already been part of a ritual suicide right. type of thing. Where his partner at the time, um, let's see here, uh, Martin Quintana, who mm. was his lover at the time, um, shot him in the head. And then ended up shooting himself in the head. But here's the thing. When you look at the autopsy... Costanza was riddled with bullets. And so wasn't yeah. uh, Mr. Quintana. 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 So here's, yeah. here's what really happened. The cops went in, and I don't know about you, but if you believe in this stuff, do you want to go up against the... Voldemort. Witch King. The Voldemort. <laughs> yeah. The Godfather. The, the ultimate... You know, the brewhirist or... or the the yeah. fucking scariest guy in Mexico. Do you want to go up, <laughs> yeah. with, up against him or do you just shoot a bunch of bullets at him and hope some of them land and he, he no longer survives? Well, again, I mean, these people these, these people who are jump running into this room actually wholeheartedly believe in all of this this black magic. And, and whether it's light magic or black magic, they believe in it. Well, and seeing the reaction after, the, after his uh, caldero was burned... I, I don't know if that's going to do anything but cement their belief. Like, th this guy was ferreted out with that. Oh, yeah. Not just ferreted. I mean, it was, like, again, part of his soul was missing, and he put up a fucking... He... he they, this was... This happened to be some of the most interesting police work I've ever seen in my life, and, like, some of the most daring police work I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, it's a bold strategy. I don't know if we'd be able to do it here. Everyone Not would, in, like, preserve the evidence, and, you know? No, exactly, because, again, you basically destroyed all of your primary evidence. <laughs> it's... It, it, but then again, you got 16 bodies you dug up, so, I mean, really, how true. much evidence do you need at that right, point? Right, exactly. Um, and again, I think they took definitely enough footage and stuff. But again, then uh, the police show up. They find, you know, they say that there was a suicide again. But you look at the pictures. Oh, he went down in a blaze of glory. He's just riddled with holes and blood coming everywhere, dude. Um, and like, and th that's basically what happened. Um, and it says, uh, it says when uh, Constanzo realized he would not uh, be able to escape, he ordered uh, a follower to shoot he and his lover, Martin Quintana, by the time police entered the apartment, Contanzo and Cortana were dead. The, uh, the survivors of the shootout, along with 12 other cult members, were uh, indicted on various charges, including multiple murder, weapons and narcotics violations, conspiracy and obstruction of justice. American authorities uh, stand ready to prosecute and uh, the convicted cult members of Mark Kilroy's murder uh, should they ever be released from Mexican custody. But the thing is, is the majority of these people were absolutely, they're, they're never going to see the day of light. They're all life sentences. They're going to die in prison. Yeah. In including Mexico. Sarah, uh, which we didn't really get much into in this episode. Oh, she's, she's her own story. It was, it was his... Uh, his second in command, the yeah, godmother. It was the sorceress, really. Yeah. yeah no, and she was a key player in actually um, sourcing out uh, Kilroy. Is that his name? Yeah, Mike Kilroy. Mike Kilroy. Mark, Mark Kilroy. Um, in this situation, she was, uh, she was a, a Texan, I think. No, she was a Mexican who made her way to getting citizenship, and, and she went to high school in, in Brownsville. And she studied uh, college in, uh, in Mexico at that time. So, like, she's a key player in, this, in, this, in this, uh, this, this whole situation, and we could definitely go into a longer thing. Yeah, as I was saying, we could uh, definitely go into a longer story about her, but she's a key factor into this, and she's an interesting different twist into this play. But she was her second command. She got caught, and uh, she's still serving time in prison. Down mm. in Mexico for this, this this crime, and I would say that she is our one of our primary sources. Yeah, for yeah. This there's, a, there's a little bit from her. Yeah, a little bit, and uh, they don't really like they they could dive deeper in the story, but again, uh, Costanzo himself is is a very very interesting figure in this whole story. He's a very interesting person. He comes from a very interesting background psychologically, uh, you know, from a nature versus nurture type of situation, and again, he was built. To be the person that he became. Yeah, no, it's it's he's a machine. Um, he's a he's a 
king. He's a wizard. He's he's all these different things. And and I, I don't know. I, I don't know that in you know forty five fifty minutes that you can do you can do justice to the story. It's it's just amazing. I encourage everybody to go out and research this. It would literally make make one of the best and darkest movies since Seven. Yeah, and I, I think that uh, that yeah yeah I think it would definitely be a, a great movie. And I, I'm glad that we, we we were able to get this topic out there again. People look more into it. It's like these people were brutally murdered, brutally killed, all because of ritual sacrifice. And there are some really rich, affluent people out there who are also responsible for these things. And again, will probably never be looked into. They found their man. Didn't really matter to them. And then uh, the book that they found, Costanzo's diary of the rituals that he performed mm. for oh, these yeah. peoples. Uh, there was a book that they found uh, after he was captured and everything of basically who named names of people who he was doing uh, some of this magic for and these rituals for. And some of these unfortunate 15 to 60 people were, were part of these uh, rich, affluent drug dealers and politicians and police officers. Yeah, one of the guys is from Interpol. I mean, the yeah. international, you know, police. we're not part of it, but the international police. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's insane. Yeah, and it goes very deep. And uh, honestly, guys, uh, this is a, a topic you should definitely do a little more research on. Again, there's not really much uh, firsthand, first uh, party um, details into it except for the investigators and stuff like that, and some of the people involved who are still alive. But, again, they're not all talking. So, But it's a cool, cool story, and we're, uh, we're glad to bring this to you uh, early in October. Yeah. Start off our October. Happy Halloween, bitches. Yeah, guys. So that is the uh, Aldolfo Costanzo story in a nutshell. Yeah, that's just a nutshell. I mean, I'd love to dive deeper into the diving deeper <laughs> of the deep dive. Of the deep dive, yeah. Yeah, you could, we, four hours on this guy wouldn't be enough. Yeah, and I think we've actually done 50 minutes on him. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, guys, thank you so much for coming to the Darkest Side podcast. Uh, that has been our episode for the day. Uh, you can find me. Again, I'm David Pottle on uh, Facebook. You can find my band Frenemy. You can find uh, me everywhere. Uh, go out and get some uh, good cannabis, everybody. Yeah, that's right. Enjoy it. <laughs> Enjoy it. It's from the earth, and from from the earth makes it of the greatest worth. Exactly. Yes. And where can people find you, Herman? Uh, you can hit me up on uh, Instagram. Everything else is bullshit. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen to that, brother. Again, thank you for coming to the Darker Side Podcast. The Darker Side. Love us. Love us. Missed you, bitches. One love, y'all.